I just thought I'd say hey to y'all and now I'm turning off my camera. I hope y'all are all well. Hi, Dr. P. Thank you. Doing well. This is Marie, by the way, Marie Mobley. Yes, your frame lights up all yellow. So good. I, I hope, um, <laughs> crash, I hope crash comes going well. <laughs> yes, ma'am, it is. It has been a joy. It's a lot of work, but it has been so rewarding. So it, it's been great. Yes, ma'am. Good, ma good. I'm, I'm glad. Yes, ma'am. Thank hey. you. <laughs> and I already forgot how to pronounce your name other than incorrectly, because I know it's not Grenice, and now I can't remember how to say it. So you're going to teach me again, but okay. Hello. So, and hey, Maddie. And hey, whoever Barnabas Vision is. I know that they were logging on and getting stuff set up. So they will be with us shortly, I'm sure. Okay, I'm going to go multitask now. Shh. Hello, Dr. P. This is Grinness. I'm on my lunch break here at the hospital. So sorry if you guys hear a siren or something go off. <laughs> That's very exciting. Grinness. Okay. See, thank you. I just keep butchering that. I don't hear anything. Scream real loud. Okay, not really. Make Andrea sing a song. I can't hear you. Can you hear me? Okay, Dr. P, can you hear me? There you go. Yep. Great. Okay. 
Can everyone see the PowerPoint as well? <laughs> yes, great. Okay, wonderful. Well, let's get started then. If, um, my name is Professor Andrea Bell, and I am an LCSW and the BSW field coordinator here at MTSU. And I just welcome you all. Thank you for being here in the classroom and on Zoom. And I'm going to do a quick introduction of Professor Jamie Langley. Um, she is an LCSW and a registered play therapist supervisor. Um, Jamie wears many, many hats. And so I'm going to also let her share a little bit about herself and her experience and practice. Um, but Jamie's also a good friend, so I just always enjoy hearing Jamie share. Um, she has so much knowledge around how powerful play can be for healing, and um, I'm excited about the time is right for some self-care <laughs> and hearing from her and her expertise around this area. Professor Bell, my mic's on. So who's ready to be a little creative today? So I hope even if you're over Zoom, you maybe have access to a few little creative material. We've got some um, here in the room. So we'll just kind of get started. But I think sometimes people may have a misconception that social work has to be boring. So I want to show you that social work doesn't have to be boring. We can be creative. And I'm going to tell a little bit about myself if I get the thing to move. Let's see if I can this way. But before that, just these are just a few little objectives for today. And Tim, I'm sorry, I know I have to kind of look over it. Either Professor King <laughs> and all that, I'll try to include you in all that. These are just a few of the things we're just, I want to talk about how creativity is good for our brains. We want to know things that are good for our brains. I actually call creativity being our brain food. We'll get ways we can use it both for client care and self care, hopefully, even both at the same time sometimes, which is pretty cool. And then maybe describe a few little activities that we can do today. So, like Professor Bell said, I'm a registered play therapist supervisor and a social worker. They're pretty um, great combination, and I feel like um, they are superpowers. So sometimes we don't think about ourselves as having superpowers, but social work, I think, can be a superpower. And so I am a professor here at MTSU. I also have a private practice in Sparta, and I'm the president of the Tennessee Association for Play Therapy. So that's a few of my hats Professor Bell is talking about. What I want to share with you a little bit today is about some of the perspective about longevity in social work, just a little bit, that if we can bring in things that we love, and are passionate about will help us stay a long time in this career. So bring what you love into what you do. So I try to talk with my students about that a lot. These are a few of the things that I love. And when I say fellowship, that's when I'm fellowshipping with other social workers. So I'm a member of several groups so I get to do things with other social workers. So I encourage that. But creativity is a big part of a lot of the things that I love. And then make time for who and what you love. So outside of our practices. What are we doing for our self-care? And these are just a few little snippets. Of course, I already had some of these pictures already loaded. This is my family. But we love to play games. We love to travel. We love to be out in nature. What are the things that you love to do? Bringing those in, both to practice and then for your care of self outside of your practice. So I'm going to do a quick check-in. Who all in here feels that creative? Or who all over Zoom feels that creative? I think sometimes we hear creative and we think, Artist. I have to be an artist. Being creative and being an artist are related but are not the same. So it's not about the end product, it's the process of, and we'll talk about that in a little bit more. But think to yourself, what are things that are that you're passionate about? And if you've got some paper, you can even write those down or you can think about them in, in your head if you want to. But what inspires you? And have you had much opportunity to experience that lately? So in the room, and probably over Zoom as well, we have students and professors. It's important for both ends of the spectrum, whether you're learning or whether you're teaching. And we as teachers know we never stop learning. Learning is a lifelong process. Being creative is a lifelong process. Have you experienced those lately? We're going to try to help you with a little bit of that today. If you know me at all as a social worker, as a play therapist, but even when I was long ago as a child, I love Mr. Rogers. I get lots of inspiration from Mr. Rogers. His birthday was in fact, just the other day, his birthday falls on the first day of spring, as does Big Bird. So I think it's kind of cool that all of them <laughs> share the same birthday. That's as a good friend of mine's daughter. So I always thought she was born on a great day. I would love to be born on the first day of spring, right? There's just something hopeful about that. And if you're not familiar with Mr. Rogers, 
get familiar. He can be very inspiring, but he did a lot for children and children's programming. And even though he's been um, deceased for many years now, he's still so inspirational. But I look, there's so many quotes. He has so many great quotes, but this is one about creativity that I wanted to share. So being creative is part of being human. Everyone is creative. Each person's creativity finds different form, that's true. But without creativity of some kind, I doubt that we get through many of the problems that life poses. It's certainly one of the most important coping skills that parents can help their children develop, which is one of the things I try to do. Because many of our children are not getting to be creative these days. They often know how to play what I say this way, so they know how to play with video games, but do they know how to be creative in other ways? So I try to help parents help their children with that. And it's also good for us as adults, which we will continue to talk about as well. So did you know that creativity is good for the brain? Anybody in here know that? So like I said, I call it brain food. There's, I'm not a brain scientist, of course, I'm a social worker, but I learn from our brain scientists, our neuroscientists. And different things. And of course, the past 10 to 20 years, we're learning so much more about our brain. But these are some quick little snippets. And we could go into a lot of these and we only have an hour. But creative activities help the brain recover after illness, injury, stress, or trauma. Oh, is my microphone messing up? You have a. Am I moving around too much? Moving hand. So it's kind of moving on. Sorry. Maybe that'll help the static. I can hear it when I move. So as social workers, aren't we helping people recover often from stress or trauma, maybe some type of injury? So knowing that creativity and creative, creative activities can help that. So many of you have probably heard of dopamine that helps improve our mood. So when we try something new, when we do a creative experience, our dopamine is increased. So our pleasure, our pleasure hormone is increased. Participating in new and, in, and or pleasurable experiences releases that dopamine in the brain. So I like to tell kids, let's do something. Let's try something new. Let's do that I did it moment. Does it have to be perfect? No, and I tell my kids all the time, there's really no such thing as perfect. If you think something's perfect, it's really probably a false perfect because underly, under, underneath there's more. So engaging in creative activity promotes the productions of new neurons. So sometimes people don't know we're always creating new neurons. It's not just during childhood, that's very important during childhood. Some of you may have done some of those brain building activities. Was that yesterday, I think, mm -hmm. that the school social workers brought those? And so, yes, childhood is very important to do those, but it's also very important to do that in our 20s, our 30s, our 80s, our 90s. Um, after trauma, the brain explores new creative outlets as part of rebuilding. So our brain does not stay stagnant. So if you're feeling stagnant, maybe you need to do something creative. That's one of the things that I often recommend. So just a few things. Sometimes we hear about left brain and right brain. So um, as Professor Bell said, I'm a play therapist and that's considered a right brain therapy. So we bypass that linguistic side because we're finding that trauma is stored in our right brain, usually in fragments. And so we want to help rewire things. And many times if it's going to, if you're going to go after something that's stored in the right brain, then you need to do a right brain type therapy. So play therapy, expressive arts, those type of things. But you don't have to be a right, sometimes people say, oh, I'm not a right brain person, so I can't be creative. Being creative is actually when you integrate your left brain and your right brain. Well, sometimes it's the processing of the creative activity, you bring that left brain in, and that's really where a lot of your healing can happen when you're integrating both. So if you feel like, oh, I'm not right brain, that doesn't mean you can't be creative. You can still develop. Creativity actually blossoms the more we do it. A good friend of mine and colleague, Dr. Janet Courtney, um, she's a social worker in Florida. She created a, a modality called First Place. She has a lot with infant mental health. And then she and I do a lot with nature and nature play therapy. But she um, wrote a book a couple of years ago about using things like creativity for trauma and things. And I won't read all this definitions because it's pretty lengthy, but it basically comes down to the imagination plus play equals creativity. That's a pretty easy one to remember. So if you're involving your imagination, if you're playing, you're being creative. But here's the thing. We often think of cute little girls like this, right? Having fun with the finger paint. Anyone hey, here's painting with finger paint lately. That's what I probably should have done was brought in a bunch of finger paints. Maybe that's what we'll do next year for such work month. We'll do some really creative, messy things. But I want you to think about that. We're never too old to play and be creative. So there's all different types of modalities and different ways we can be creative. And I want to share a few of those. And again, you don't have to be artistic. 
I wanted to briefly share this. This is something we use in play therapy, but I still think it's valid for all of us. There are therapy powers inherent in play. They came from Dr. Charles Schaefer, who's considered our father of play therapy. However, there's a lot of these things that we can use within our creativity. So again, with imagination plus creativity, um, plus play equals creativity, we can still involve those. It's still good for adults to play and be creative. And these are the different types of things. So sometimes if you're thinking, oh, I've got a client who's stuck, they're not able to communicate. Maybe think of some type of creative play that they could do. And again, this doesn't mean you have to be an LCSW either. You might be a case manager at your BSW level and want to do a vision board with the client. And that's perfectly fine. That's perfectly within your realm of confidence. I mean, of course, the more you do things and study things, the better you'll be able to do that. But think about ways that you can help them create a problem solve. If anything, the pandemic has taught us, and hopefully it's taught us a few things. But one of the things is that we can creatively problem solve. I never thought I'd do play therapy over a screen like this. I get to have tea parties over a screen now and different things. I had to go outside my comfort zone, get outside that box a little bit and learn different ways to do things. A lot of us have, are doing things we never thought possible before. I'm getting to present to Australia next week because of the power of the screen, because I can do that, because we can link up. So there's a lot of great things that we're, we're learning how to do. So this is just a quick little chart. I can send it to anyone that's interested um, with that, just showing all the different, different powers of play. But many times people don't realize, wow, all this can happen through play. And I could talk to you all day about that, but I won't today. <laughs> we'll keep going. Expressive arts, there's also expressive arts therapies. There's art therapy, but there's also music therapy. There's movement therapy. There's poetry therapy. I mean, almost creative writing therapy, almost anything you can think of in terms of the creativity realm. There is, there's even an International Expressive Arts Therapy Association. So some of you may be interested in learning more about that. But what I like to pull from the expressive arts is they really help us realize that it's not about the final result. So, you know, in my HUBSI class, we're getting ready to talk about the next level of the Ericksonian stages where in that middle childhood, we start realizing, wait, people may start looking at my work and suddenly they may stop creating. And it's really sad. And sometimes that may stay with us through adolescence, through adulthood. So we are like concerned that someone's going to judge what I do. But if we can help, our, help remind our clients, if we can help remind ourselves, remind our students, remind each other, it's not about that result. It's about the process of, it's actually got a Greek word called poesis, and I may not be pronouncing it quite right because I haven't taken Greek, but that's what it looks like to me. So it really is, and you can kind of read more about that, but it's really about that natural process. We take everyday expectations and we use the imagination and creativity to make some type of art or some type of creative product. So if we get that self-discovery, that understanding, that healing, does it really matter what it looks like? Creativity also across all cultures, there's some type of creativity. So one of the things I encourage you to do if you have clients is find out Definitely what their culture is, but what was done for, what is done as creativity in that culture? Because it may be different. Some cultures may do something more with like molding. So think of like ceramics and pottery and those type of things. Others may do more with painting. Others may do more with movement and with music. I encourage a lot of my play therapy supervisors to consider much more about music. I don't think we talk about music and music is something that transcends all ages, all cultures, they have different types of music. So look at how culturally they're being creative. Maybe their ancestors are being creative. That may be something they can bring into the creativity they do. So I like to talk about the creativity umbrella, especially when I'm doing play therapy trainings, but it's good for here too, that all these different types of things, the way to play. So for an adult, as an adult, I think about my creativity as my way to play. And again, that might be writing, that might be the visual creative art, that might be movement, that might be drama. There are drama therapies, that's another expressive art and the music. Here's just a quick list of different expressive art materials you might use. And so some of the things you might ex expect, things like crayons and paints. I even brought crayons today. We're gonna to do something with crayons a little bit. Some of you watching over Zoom may or may not have access to crayons. Um, but you can also use colored pencils, construction paper, glitter glue, journal. Some of you may journal, it's another creative play gel pens, even using magazines for like collages. So you may have those, but also what's really fun and what I utilize a lot, especially during those early days of telehealth, when um, two years ago when we were trying to figure out what we were doing all of a sudden when everything was shutting down was what's around the house that you can use. 
mops can make great puppets. Did you know that? We found that out. <laughs> There's all kinds of things you can do with the brown paper bag. For those of you in the room, I gave all of you a paper clip. And you might have put, and some paper. Some of you watching over there, you may have a paper clip nearby. And you may be going, oh, I'm supposed to paper clip these papers together, which is what we usually think of for paper clip. I don't think you take that paper clip just for a minute. And what can you make out of it? Have you tried making anything out of a paper clip lately? See what you can come up with. So the people in the room are kind of grinning like, I don't know about this. <laughs> Try it. You're also laughing a little bit, so it can also be a little bit fun, but what can you make with a paper clip? You'd probably be surprised. You can actually make several things with a paper clip. So that's a really quick way to be creative. If you're a little stuck, sometimes like I'll, I'll go outside for a little bit, but maybe you can't get outside the day. Maybe it's too cold or it's raining. We're having a good day right now, but I think rain is coming in tonight. So what if it wasn't safe to go outside or you weren't able to? Do a little something creative in your office space, in your cubicle, in your car, wherever you may be doing your social work practice from. Have some things like little paper clips and see what you can make. And we won't even have you share them because I know people worry about what are people going to think about what I make. But think about things like buttons. I love to use coffee filters, popsicle sticks. I'll show you the activity of popsicle sticks in just a few minutes. So very common things that we can use, cloth pieces, ropes, hula hoops, all kinds of things that we can have creative play, creative fun with. Now in the art therapy world, I did just want to include this a little bit in expressive, from expressive arts, that there's different levels of control. So one of the things you do want to be aware of, especially if you're using these things with clients, is that the top of the list are things you have most control of. And that's where you want to start. You want to start with things they have more control of. Especially for clients that are in trauma, that as they as we go down to things with less control, it may invite more things from the trauma. So we probably want to have more training when you're doing some of those down towards um, the bottom. But lead pencils, color pencils, again, think about the control that comes with that. So often that's a good place to start. I like to start with crayons. For a lot of my teenagers, and if I'm doing things with families, because many times they haven't used crayons in a while, um, so it's fun to do. My younger kids, they use crayons, so what do they want to do? They want to use the color pencils or the markers, because mom and dad or <laughs> teacher has said you can't use markers. I do advise on the washable markers. That helps a lot. Professor Bell has young children. <laughs> She's like, yes, so definitely that um, helps with all that. I want to include a little study. So I use this in a lot of my presentations. It's a great study at the University of Toledo in Ohio. So they did toddler, they had some toddlers, they had a control group and a study group. And I use it because so many times we think, oh, all these things we have to have. I have new therapists that will come, if they see my office, oh, I don't have all those things. I don't have all those toys. I'm like, you don't have to. I actually teach they need five things to do play therapy that they need. Paper and crayons, which we all have in here today, bubbles, play doh, and then the play therapist. So you that we're guiding the play. But for many of us, we could do so much just with paper and crayons. If I gave you right now, say, how can you be creative with paper and crayons? You could come up, we could have hundreds of ideas. So we don't, it doesn't take a lot of supplies, but here's some research that supports that. So when they took these group of toddlers, they gave one group four toys and one group 16 toys. Which group do you think played the longest and the most creatively? It was the group with four toys. That's a big lesson for a lot of us. What they found out was the more toys, kids tend to get more, they would kept random. They wouldn't get into the play as much. They weren't as creatively playing. This is a great one to use for parents. You don't have to buy a hundred things for birthdays or holidays or Christmas. Sometimes less can be more. And that's good for us to know is that we don't necessarily have to have all those creative supplies. Maybe we just have some coffee filters and popsicle sticks and crayons. See what you can do with it. So here's some of the things from household products. And I actually have, I actually grabbed a paper towel from our break room today. It was about, and I thought, yeah, just think about, lots of times I'll ask people to think about what they can do with a stick. But since we're not outside today, what can you do with a paper towel roll? You see right there from the kids, they're using some kind of telescope. Can you communicate with it? Can you pretend to hear with it? Can you hit with it? What else could this be? In the ring. What else could it be? A wand. A wand, a magic wand, other types of wand, what else? A lightsaber, yeah, a lot of Star Wars fans. I think swords comes up 
often. Yeah, could it be a fan of some type? Could it be a baton? I mean, so it's similar to a stick if you're doing some of these activities. And this is similar on this slide where it shows this is not really a box. Look at all these things that can be. Again, that's creative thinking with that. How many of you have ever seen a child that played with the box more than the toy that came in the box? Or the gift that came in the box? They can be very great. So during this time of Amazon shopping <laughs> and, and the like that many people do, I tell them to keep the boxes because you may be able to create a spaceship out of that box. You might be able to create a volcano or a mountain out of that box. So all kinds of things. Encourage kids and the kid inside yourself, again, for that self-care piece. So quickly, these are just a few little things. Just again, look at how these are just household products. So I do a lot of puppet making. A lot of us have thought about socks and paper sacks, but maybe you haven't thought about oven mitts, paper plates. On that bottom right, those are toilet tissue rolls. They make great monster puppets, all kinds of monster things that we can do. I also want to remind us that when we do these things, that again, it's created for across the lifespan. So don't think about creative creativity and creative play is just for kids. Why should kids have all the fun, number one? We need to have fun too. Families, embrace, letting families embrace this together. Isn't that one of our core competencies about how we work with families and groups can do this? This is a supervision group picture in that top right. So I do a lot of this sometimes when I do group supervision. But look at that picture in the left with an older couple. Creativity is so important in older age. There are studies that show us that now it helps prevent or decrease on the prevalence of Alzheimer's and dementia. Isn't that enough incentive to do, be creative? I know for me in my 50s, I'm like, I want to be as creative as possible <laughs> and all that. So finding those ways to be creative. But again, if you're working with the older generation, if you're working in geriatric social work, bring them fun, creative things for them. They're never too old to play or be creative. I like to use vision boards in my um, field one class. We make a social work vision board at the end of the semester. So what are their goals? What are their hopes? What are their dreams? There's something about visualizing it. So not just talking about it, but actually visualizing it and then putting that visual on some paper and doing that. So, and it can be very healing. There's certain things you can also, you know, there may be something that you want to work through. You're feeling a little stuck. Sometimes people think we can only do vision boards once a year. So, I tend to do them at the beginning of the year. You can do them for every season. You can do them during a challenging time. Maybe if you're just feeling stuck about something. Maybe you just want to express more about yourself to someone. So that might be more of a collage. What's a collage about myself? <coughs> I didn't include, I don't know if many of you have heard of soul collage. So that has been my self-care over the pandemic. I was introduced to this out of um, Expressive Arts, um, the Florida Institute of Expressive Arts. And they do it all online. And I started it in April, 2020. So the timing was perfect. And I've been, and I did one just last night. So it um, depends on how often we meet. Sometimes it's monthly, sometimes it's every other month. But a soul collage. And so again, you don't have to be artistic. It's just, it's making, it's a card. You end up making a deck of cards. But it's, um, and I use so much online about nature. So I bring in lots of nature pictures and different things. So all different kinds of ways we can help be, people be creative and then being creative for ourselves with this. Um, sometimes symbol work. So I did this in a supervision session yesterday morning. And so I just asked everybody, we were actually, we were concluding our supervision time together as a group. And I said, just look around the room and what symbol can you find to represent what this process has been? Someone grabbed a plant to represent growth. I had a necklace that had keys and a lock on it. I used that. There were some different things that, that people brought in. So I can there's not a lot in this room, but there may be in this classroom. It's a pretty sterile environment in here because we don't have plants or anything, but there might be something that we could use as a symbol. This was actually this picture of the plate is something Paris Goodger Brown is a social worker in Franklin, and we're in a consultation group together. And she was leading us all in a supervision exercise. And so this was about three things about supervision, bringing in symbols about to you what's, what's important about supervision. And so I picked these three symbols and then unintentionally when I went to go put them away, I, I had this quote about the starfish. Some of you may have heard it and I've used a lot with my um, therapy and with my supervision. And it's a story about a little boy and an older gentleman who was walking on the shore and the little boy is throwing the starfish in and the older gentleman is like, 
there's hundreds of these. Why are you doing that? You can't save them all. And what we'll picks up a starfish and throws it in says, because it's important to that one. And sometimes I think as social workers, we get a little overwhelmed by all the tragedy, all the things that are needed. But it's important to that one. So I use that starfish a lot. So I have that starfish around my office and, and all that. So that was part of why that was in that, that plate. What was interesting and what I didn't plan, sometimes it's really fun, the things we don't plan. And I picked up that starfish and, it, and if you can see in the picture on the right, maybe a little hard to see here in the room, but there's an imprint of the starfish on that little piece of sand. And I remember grabbing Leslie Rice as a social worker that was standing next to me. I was like, Leslie, look at this. And she's like, because we do, that's what we do. We leave our imprint. We want them to be positive imprints and all that. But I thought that was, that it was just a, a neat experience. Courage starts with showing up and letting ourselves be seen. I could probably quote Renee Brown all day, but that's one of, my favorite one. So again, I talk about vulnerability. Our clients are going to be vulnerable with us. There are going to be times we feel vulnerable when we're being creative, but that shows a side to us that maybe we just don't get to let out very often. I mentioned popsicle sticks earlier. So I have a friend, um, Tammy Van Hollander. She's a colleague. She's a therapist in Philadelphia, and she created this technique called greatness sticks, and I love. So it's something that anyone here in the room can do. Again, you don't have to be an LCSW to do this. You just find positive characteristics and put them on popsicle sticks. Now, I actually, in my office, I have used colored popsicle sticks. You can get them at the Dollar Tree, dollar stores, different things. And then I use markers and, I, and just what are all kinds of positive characteristics you can think of. And I have them just in a, like in a little basket. And then I ask kids or teenagers or families, pick out the ones that you feel are relevant to you. What is it that makes you great? And sometimes we don't necessarily think about ourselves as being great. But all of us, we all have some type of greatness. And so especially if we're doing like self-esteem work or different things, trying to help encourage what are the things. And so this is one that Tammy made. So this is um, Tammy's picture of some things. And then um, if you had this, now again, this is when the play therapy piece kind of comes in a little bit more because Tammy has all types of toys and things in her office. She says, then pick out a symbol for you and put in the center. And then you're surrounded by your greatness. I actually had a couple of kids that did this and they had put a little dollhouse figure in, in it and sand holds that really well, but you don't have to have sand and all that. And so um, I had a couple different kids. They did this, they put it around because my popsicles are colored. A couple of them said, man, it looks like peacock. I'm like, and what do we think of with the peacock? Peacocks are proud. They love displaying, that. but they're not always seen. Those feathers aren't always seen because what does the peacock also do? Right? It folds them up sometimes, sometimes for safety and protection. So maybe we don't always see them, but they're always part of us. They're inherent as a part of us. And so they make their own, they can even make their own sticks. They can take them home. We talk about how they can close them up. They can bring them out. All different types of things that you can do. It'd be really easy activity to do with clients. But don't you think it's also good for us to do? Because sometimes we're not feeling so great. We may be feeling challenged. Am I really being helpful? Am I really learning all that I need to learn? I've got all these, speaking of some of the students in the room, I've got all these papers due, projects due. I got to see on the last one. Am I really that great? So sometimes an activity like this, what are the things that make me great? What are the things that help me thrive? You know, we're going from a time of surviving. Everybody's ready to start thriving again, right? What can I do to help me thrive? When we work with our clients that are going through really dark times, Help and encourage them that they can thrive. Sometimes surviving is good, but the thriving is even better. So finding those things that they can be great. It's also a great family activity. Now I do have a little caveat with that. One time I had a teenager. She did these and she was so proud of herself. She didn't think she had that many things that she was great about. She wanted to bring her dad in. You know, can I show my dad? And I'm like, sure. Her dad comes in and it starts out really great. He's like, wow. I love that you chose this, this, and this about you. And then he said, but you know, if you tried harder, you could also choose this, this, and this, which was not part of the plan. So I've now learned I'm going to coach parents before they come in because he did that, but this. So I challenge us not to have that part. Yes, we can also talk about, and I have talked with kids about, what are some things that maybe you want to be more great in? So that can be like a goal. It would be a really good way to set a goal. And all that, but families, having them choose for each other what they what greatness do they see in each other? Our families often need empowered. Oftentimes they a, a mother may not realize that her son sees greatness in her. 
a child may not realize their dad sees greatness in them. So this can be very powerful. And again, what are you talking about? Popsicle stick, right? Whether you print off words, write words in markers. And again, I really love it if they have something tangible they can take home. So it's a great um, tangible activity to be able to use. Many of you know, if you have me in class, goodness, I'm always talking about we need to go outside and play more, not just for kids and for families, but for ourselves. So there's lots of healing in nature. And I won't go into a lot of that today, but nature actually helps inspire creativity. So again, that's why it's great if you only have five minutes. There's research that shows I'm looking at a bench right outside our, our classroom, sitting on that bench, doing nothing but sitting on the bench can help our mood. It can help provide clarity. Even more so if you really start attending in with your senses. So if you start paying attention to not only what you see, but what do you feel? So sometimes I'll just have clients take some moment. What do you feel? What does the sun feel like? What do you hear? Kids get really quiet. So we're working on all those executive function skills in a fun way that they don't realize. And they're like, oh, I can hear a bird. I can hear the wind. What do you smell? Smell is one of our highest senses that we don't talk a lot about. That sense of smell that can be so powerful. And there's a lot of research that says not only being in nature, but really paying attention to what's in nature and activating the senses, how much that helps our emotional wellness. Again, it inspires us. So we often feel more creative. So again, if you're feeling stuck, go outside. Doesn't mean you have to run a marathon, go sit on the bench. Probably better if you run a marathon or at least walk. There's a lot of benefits to walking um, while we're outside. But get that and then come in and you might be surprised how creative you feel. You can't always get outside, bring nature in. This is actually my nature station. I call it my nature creativity station at my office. And that centerpiece, that's a, um, what they call a tree cookie. I actually bought it at Home Depot. So you don't have to go out and actually cut down trees. You can buy them, but if you have trees. Um, a friend of mine, when there was a storm and the tree came down, she's like, who can I find that can go cut me a bunch of tree cookies and all that. Some people use them for decor now and things, but that's a mandala that was made on that. Um, tree cookie and so you may not know as much as uh, you may not know about mandalas but it's a circular shape and oftentimes a pattern doesn't have to be um it's a, a, a sanskrit word i mean it's been around for centuries a lot of religions and um, meditative mindful this practice use mandalas so i found there's so much stress and chaos a lot of times my kids need to come in and just have a few moments to make something and so if we can't always go outside and make the nature mandala we can do it inside Underneath that tray is a circular sand tray that we can also make them in the sand. But bringing in leaves, acorns, uh, let me grab right here. So you can actually go on mandala hunts. So again, with mandalas being a very, it's gonna be hard to read in the room, I'm gonna have to pass around the pine cone. But I don't know if you can see, but see that about perspective. So when you look at that pine cone, maybe you don't realize there's actually a mandala. There's mandalas all through the universe all in nature. Um, but I, I, there's all kinds of ways to be creative with the pine cone. Sometimes I've used it to, let's think of a positive attribute for every one of these that we can list or how many people care and love about you for every one. Or can we make a bird feeder, peanut butter and bird seed, an old Cub Scout hat that I use a lot. And again, kids can watch as the birds come. So it's a very mindful activity that also promotes a lot of executive function that they actually got to help participate in. Um, those of you in the room won't be able to see this, but those of you at home, let's see. This is a walnut shell, but can you see it looks like it's got a little face that way? And the face actually changes and becomes a little bit scarier that way. But there's an instant storytelling object right there from a walnut shell. Um, so again, all kinds of things that you can have in your, in your office. So even if you're in, like in, in your field, so different ways that you can bring nature in and different types of healing ways, but again, creative ways to, to use that. So I'm a big proponent of nature play. As I've said, if you wanna learn out more, um, always talk to me, you're always welcome to talk to me, different things. I really got inspired therapeutically about using it when I read Last Child, Last Child in the Woods by Richard Liu, which talks about nature deficit disorder and how he was correlating from a lot of the studies that as our children's mental health is declining, also their time outside of nature is declining. Um, and we're finding that more and more. And so now the research is really supporting the more time in nature to improve mental health and well-being. Like I said, it helps with us being more creative, helps with a lot of things. So that's one of the reasons I'm so into that. Um, 
and trying to promote that, promote that for our emotional wellness. But again, a stick doesn't have to just be a stick. So just like the thing with the cardboard box earlier, look at all those things that can be, that's creative thinking. And then playing those things, having all those creative ways to play. If you can be that creative with just a stick, imagine what else, how all the ways you can be creative with all other types of things. Another basic are rocks. Some of you may be doing this already, painting rocks. It's been kind of a big thing. Sometimes it's leaving them for others to find. It's a very creative activity. It can also be very nurturing, connecting because you're leaving it for others. You can do a lot of powerful words, pictures. I also did this, include this picture. Like you can even make things like nature monsters. Like who would have thought, right? But again, a very creative activity to do. So lots of things you can do um, with rocks. Again, that'd be pretty easy to bring in offices. Um, here's just a few leaf activities. So again, being creative in lots of different ways. You know, Thanksgiving, oftentimes I'll talk with my families about the, making a gratitude tree. We know, I actually taught a class a few years ago. We used to have an elective called How to Live a Wonderful Life. And we talked about the eight um, things that you can do that lead to better emotional wellness and a life, life well lived. And gratitude was one of those eight. Sometimes we forget about things that we're grateful for. And so helping um, clients, and this can be done at any time of the year. I actually have a book. I should have brought, I have a book about gratitude. It's by um, someone of the Cherokee Nation. And it talks about gratitude is not just limited to one time of the year. Gratitude can be all year long. And so what are the ways that we can encourage gratitude? So have a little leaf. They could be real. You can make leaves and make it a little gratitude tree about things that you're grateful for. Do any of you remember in the room, I can't see you at home, but anybody remember doing these little leaf rubbings when you were a kid? Did you know that's really helping your executive function skills? That you're being pretty creative at the same time? So again, just coloring the different things. You can make those into characters if you wanted. That bottom picture on the bottom right shows about a little creative activity using leaves where they're making like an owl and a bird and a butterfly. So all types of ways to be creative using nature. I really love something called loose parts play. Has anybody here in the room heard of loose parts play? We don't talk about it in the United States very much. It's very popular in Europe. Started about the 1970s. Um, very popular in uh, Australia and then also Canada um, somewhat. It's really just having random parts. They don't have to have any connection at all. And they don't all, they don't have to be nature. I tend to use nature with mine. But you could have nuts and bolts. You could have buttons. You could have paper clips. You can have all different kinds of objects. You just put them out and see what, what creative play can happen with it. Again, any age can do this, even really young. So you see that picture of that little boy? But he's really young. He's got some little type of clay. He's working around with some, some loose parts. I actually, I call them, when I use these, I call them nature's Legos. Because Legos are a great way to be creative. And so again, I just, I just have a basket of random items. And they're either, in my basket, they're the nature items or they're organic, like there may be some like wood pieces or like I have a wooden spool. So it's something that's made out of wool. So um, it was nature inspired, organically inspired. And again, just seeing all the great imaginative ways that can be created, <laughs> bless you. And then again, does it come at a lot of cost? Doesn't take a lot of space. You can do it inside, outside. You can do it in the car if needed. So if they're more doing some social work on the go. And again, could that be good for us to do? Just to have some time and just have Maybe look around your office. What are some of the different random things in your office? And can you make something creative out of it? Like were some of you, were some of you surprised about how creative you were with the paper clip? Hey, Jamie, yes. My son, my oldest son, is a medical clear. Yes. And they all have Legos in their office. Yes. Because with that, they, they you know, they use that for the creativity to stimulate the models that they're using to do, you know, that they do for. Right. Uh, as the guy Professor King mentioned his son is a mechanical engineer and they have all have Legos in their office. There's actually, and I don't know if he knows, if he has that, this, I was telling my son who's an accountant, he's now back in school again to get his MBA. There's something called Lego Serious Play. Someone took the Legos and, and they have created it and they've taken it into the business world because realize that they can be creative with their play with Legos, they're more creative and they're problem solving and thinking in other ways. So the business community, and I know some people don't necessarily think about business and social work, but there is a business part to social work sometimes, um, but that it can lead to more creative problem solving. And so their creativity is one of the skills employers actually look for. 
that was a good point, Professor King. Thank you for bringing that up. Again, here's just more ways that this is another mandala. It's another picture of a mandala in the upper left screen. So again, just all kinds of ways with nature to be creative and messy play. So I said, maybe we'll have to do this next year. Maybe we'll have to figure out ways to be messy. So thinking about finger paints, um, it could be mud, it could be leaves. I know sometimes parents are like, oh, I don't know if I want my child to get messy. It's good for them to get messy. They'll clean up. Clothes will wash. If you're really concerned about your clothes, go to a thrift store. Get some clothes. You may remember Sound of Music? What did she do with the kids? They were all lined up with the whistle and the uniforms. What did she do? She made them play clothes out of curtains. A little, a little hair twist there, I guess. But you don't have to make out of curtains. You can just t-shirt and jeans or pants or, or something. Again, no longer. I've had sometimes parents apologize when they bring their kids to me and they've got grass stains on because they played at recess. I'm like, that's exactly what I want to see. <laughs> They're playing at recess. Our kids don't get enough um, play. So I'd love to see that. So in here in the room, when was the last time any of you were messy? You been messy lately? Think it's good for our self-care to be messy? It is. Just have some random fun. So maybe, like I said, maybe next time we'll bring finger paints or something. There's also time just to be silent. So having those rest times in between our play, in between our creativity, again, having that sanctuary. That sanctuary has been a big word for me the last year that really resonates with me. Um, I've even made some dates with myself. I've checked myself into bed and breakfast and stayed there all by myself. Two times now, I've had the bed and breakfast all to myself. It's nothing against my husband. I love my husband, but there are times I just want to be me. And my husband's like, don't you want to take some friends with you? And I'm like, uh, maybe sometime. This time I'm just going with myself. And I love it so much the first time I went back a second time over spring break. Look at this quote. It's during moments of silence that our own voice is heard the loudest. So during that silent time, we can be creative. We can contemplate about things that may lead us to more creativity. Our brain's going to be much better for it. Having all these creative times and then times of sanctuary, times of, of peace. So now I want us to have a little opportunity to be creative. So I know here in the room we did the um, paper clips. And so if you have this at home or your office, if you're watching over Zoom, or for those of us in the room, um, Professor Bell, do you mind handing, um, letting everybody grab some crayons? So you may not have crayons, but if you have, even if you just have some markers, pens, whatever. And what I want you to do first is just, just draw a picture of a human figure, like a gingerbread man or woman. And it doesn't have to be perfect because why? It's about the process, not the end product. So everybody draw just a human figure. So, you know, the gingerbread, a head, the two hands, the legs. I started to copy off <coughs> one for here in the room. And then I thought, well, those of you at home that can join over Zoom, that wouldn't be exactly fair for us. We're all be on the same playing field. We're just gonna draw that and try to draw it as big as your piece of paper. So like if you've got an eight and a half or by 11, you know, type in sheet, draw a big figure. Okay, head, your arms and hands, your little torso, your little legs, draw your gingerbread person. I can't see you over Zoom, but I agree with it. Got some people here in the room trying it out. And I always say mine, mine doesn't look very good. It looks like a dancing gingerbread, uneven person. That's okay. <laughs> and this is about the process, having fun with the process. Being great. So once you have your person, this is what I want you to think about. So this is kind of the self-care part, but again, you could do this with client care. You can have clients do this. What are the things you need for creativity? What are the things that you can do for creativity for different parts of you? So I want, and what I mean by that is what could you do that's really good for your head? What could be some creativity that's really good for your head? What could be some creativity that's really good for your hands and your arms? Like some creativity that could be really good for your torso. Like some creative self-care that could be good for your legs and your feet. And again, it doesn't only have to be the creative arts. So creativity, I've talked a lot about the creative arts today. Creativity may be cooking. 
My husband last night actually cooked for me the first time in a long time because I had soul collage last night after my classes. And he had the day off and I said, oh, you can make the day off. You can make, you can make our dinner. <laughs> I gave him a little challenge he probably wasn't prepared for but because he doesn't cook very often. And he, he cooked outside the box for sure. It was something I would not have thought of. <laughs> he made salmon patties. I was like, I don't think I've had those. It was something from his mom. He actually went to his childhood and thought about something from his mom. And all that. But he talked about how fun it was just to be creative. He was looking through some recipes. I mean, I guess when I said, hey, make a meal, he really went for it um, and all that. So, because his meal making is usually like when we cook out and grill out. Things like that. But he can't, so it might mean something a little outside the box. Maybe it's, um, what is it, cry cut? The, I know one of our, what is it? Cricket, Cricket yes. But I know we have some on staff that like to use. And I was really impressed. I was like, wow, they were creative and I didn't know that about them. I won't name any name. <laughs> but it's good, right? Another way to be creative and all that. So it doesn't just have to be drawing and painting. Can you be creative? Maybe there's some way in nature you want to be creative. Maybe you want to like write lyrics to a song. Maybe it's just humming. Can humming just be creative? My mom was a hummer. My younger son is a hummer. He got that humming. Because I know when we'll do things, they hum. I'm a singer. I tend to sing. They hum. So what are the ways you can be creative? So again, for your head. Oh, no, left out. Sorry, your heart. What's a creative way for your heart? So on that figure drawing, a little gingerbread person. And creativity for your arms, your hands. We know that kinesthetically that helps so much. All the nerve endings we have in our hands and our fingers. So a lot of creativity that comes with our hands. Maybe you like to do pottery. The touch can be very healing. Those are the things that you like to touch. Sometimes out in nature, we'll talk about the different things that we feel. Sometimes it's prickly. Sometimes it's, kids love to use, use the word prickly. If you've got something prickly out there, like little things from the gum tree are often prickly. So what can you touch? And then maybe it's walking. Again, things that you can do with your legs and your feet, your torso. So all the types of ways that you can be creative for yourself. Look okay, in the room, and if anybody over Zoom, you know, wants to unmute yourself, you're of course welcome to do that. But are there some other ways about being creative? Maybe we haven't talked about that maybe someone really likes. The other thing the research shows is as you're working on your on your figure of yourself, the more we creative we are, the more creative we become. So once we start doing creative, creative activity, once we start being more creative, it just grows and grows and flourishes and flourishes. I found that with my soul collage. It's that I don't wanna go a long time without doing it. And one time, one had to be canceled and we went, um, I think we went like a three, two or three week period of not having soul collage and I really missed it. So I started doing it on my own. I loved it in community and in group, but I started doing it on my own. Again, I needed that creative outlet. So as you're finishing up your pictures, are there any questions? Anybody in the room have any questions? I know it's good about time for us to go. Anybody over Zoom have any questions? <laughs> Oh, and I have a little housekeeping. If you could put your name in your Zoom box that we get, especially for students that may be getting extra credit or anything like that. Having that. I think everybody here in the room has signed in. So if you can make sure you have your, your correct name on there, and that way we'll get you all attended for. All right, so any questions? Are we all, here's my question for everyone. Are y'all ready to be more creative now? I heard I'm trying in the room. I got some yeses. Okay, so maybe a little bit. And is this something you can see yourself doing with clients? Pretty easy, right? Something I want you to do, if you have, the, if you have your crayons right now, take your crayon and just rub in your hand. Sometimes just that. 
And they don't have to be new crayons either. Sometimes old crayons are great because you can use the side, you can go really hard. It doesn't, if your crayon's great, great. Keep on going. But yeah, just with some of that, sometimes I even do a little feeling work like, if there's a blue crayon, what kind of things do you feel? If, what do you feel as a blue? What is blue invading you? What is green? Sometimes we can do a little feeling things in there. So that's a little creative way to bring in some other things. So I hope you've enjoyed that. I hope you will be more creative, both for yourself and for um, care of others. I do have some resources. So if anybody needs this PowerPoint, I'm glad to send it to you. I can send it to you the PDF version um, with all that. So all these are different, different ways. Um, this book right here is a brand new book, Nature-Based Play and Expressive Therapies, Interventions for Children, Teens, and Families that I'm a co-editor on. I'm part of the et al. <laughs> you know, but the new ways when there's, there's five editors, so I'm one of the et al. But it actually hasn't made it to America yet. We're waiting. It should be any day or we have shown you a copy and all that. But different kinds of things, different resources. Um, I don't know if I brought it in my bucket or not, but like even in my office, I have like three different books about creativity. So using creative, like here's one, the creative arts and counseling. So can you be a creative social worker? Yes, you can. I hope you know now a little bit more, some of the ways to try that. Everyone have a good rest of your week, good day, and thank you for letting me part of your social work month. Thank you, Professor Langley. Thank you. You're welcome. Yes, yeah, you want to check all of the yeah. names, make sure you got everybody. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Oh, oh hi, David. Oh, someone crochet, so that was a good one. Yeah. Yeah, I should have been looking at the chat. So, yes, crocheting is definitely great. Bye. Thank you. Dr. McElroy is creative. Yes. I love the book. Marie Mobley. You have Madison now? See, I don't. Is that Sissabaugh? Sissabaugh? E A T H? Okay. And Marie Mobley? Okay. Glad you have her. <laughs> Congratulations, it all counts. <laughs> <laughs> Dr. McElroy. It does count. See, you need to send that info out to make sure everybody knows. Mm -hmm. Who does the G R A? Who else the T? That person, Gray Knees. I don't know. I don't know who that is. Did they put their name in the chat? Not because I, I think it would have changed. You want to put Gray? Go up to the very tip, of the top, and see if we know their name. And we should be. I've been making the last cracks. Keep it clean, Doctor Piello. Mm -hmm. I don't know who that is. I'm going to have a student list. And it may not even be a student. Do you just want to put G R A E S E? And if we have someone, yeah. G R A E S E. Is it S E or C E? C E. I wonder if there's a Grace. I wondered if it was like a Grace or something. Now, someone says Josie Campbell. Yeah, I got Josie. Okay. I think that's everyone. Okay, great. Thank you. Yay, you're great. Oh, thank you. Yeah. So we had a few people show up. Yes. Yes. That's always good. It is always good. Because <laughs> we've had a well, one of them for a week. Well, and I, real, I was going to make these little flyers. Remember, I sent that flyer and you changed, and I was like, yes, I was like, no, I never did that. It's, they've had a lot, you know.